Section 8 of Astounding Stories, March 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Bateman. The Soul Master by Will Smith and R.J. Robbins. Part 2. After leaving the journal office, Jimmy proceeded directly to a certain stable where he kept his private car. It was a long, low speedster with a powerful engine and capable of eating up distance. It was the work of a minute to touch the starter and back out of the yard. For the next hour, he held the wheel grimly while the car roared over the seventy-odd miles to Keegan. Would he be in time? At last, a signpost told him that he was within five miles of the railroad crossing at Keegan. Now the headlights were picking out the black outlines of the freight shed, and the next moment he had swept over the tracks. The luminous dial on his wristwatch notified him that he had been on the road but little over an hour, but his spirits somehow refused to revive with the knowledge. About a mile beyond the station, he drove the car into a dark wood road and parked it, turning off all lights. The rest of the way to the professor's mansion he did on foot. Rather than approach from the front of the grounds, he nimbly climbed a stone wall and, crossing a field or two, entered the stretch of woods which extended just behind the mansion. His pocket flashlight here came into use, and once or twice he gave a reassuring pat to a rear pocket where bolts a heavy Colt automatic. What was that? He'd approached very close to the rear of the house now. No lights were visible as yet, but unless he was greatly mistaken, he'd heard a muffled scream. He stopped in his tracks and listened intently. Again it came, this time with a blood-curdling cadence ending in what he would have sworn was a choking sob. The little job of getting the old-fashioned rear window open was a mere nothing to the experienced O'Hara, and in a moment he was inside the house. His feet struck soft carpet. Cat-like, he stepped to one side in order to prevent any hidden eyes from perceiving his form silhouetted in the dim light of the open window. He dared not use his flashlight for fear that the circle of light would betray his position, thus making him an excellent target for possible bullets. Following the wall closely, he managed to circle the room without mishap. His searching fingers finally came in contact with a door frame, and he breathed a sigh of relief. Here there was nothing to bar his progress except some moth-eaten portieres. These he brushed aside. The room which he now entered was probably the same into which the professor had ushered Handland and Perry the day before. There being still no sign of life about, the reporter decided to throw caution to the winds. He brought his flash into play. Quickly casting the powerful beam around the chamber, he examined the place with an all-searching glance. Nothing. With a stifled oath, he turned his attention to the other rooms in the immediate vicinity. The brilliant light revealed not the slightest trace of a person, living or dead. The sound must have come from the second story, or from the cellar. He decided on the upper floor. Feverish with impatience because of the valuable time he had already lost, he bounded up the heavily carpeted stairs two at a time. Now to his keen ears came certain faint sounds which told him that he was on the right track. Before him extended a long, dusty hall terminating in a single heavy door. Several other doors opened at intervals along the corridor. One or two of these were open, and he threw the beam from his flash hastily into one after another of them. He saw only dusty and mildewed chamber furnishings of an ancient, massive style. Suddenly he pricked up his ears. The door ahead of him was creaking slowly open. Instantly he extinguished his torch and leaped into the nearest room. Whoever was opening that end door was carrying a lamp. What if the professor had accomplices who might discover him and overpower him by force of numbers? O'Hara drew the automatic from his pocket, deriving a comforting assurance from the feel of the cold steel. Here was something no man could resist, could he but get it into action. The light was now nearly abreast of his door, and for a sickening instant he thought the prowler was coming into the room. He held his breath. Now the lamp was at the open door, and now it was quickly withdrawn. After a breathless second, he tiptoed forward and peered cautiously down the hallway. About here it was that James O'Hara began to realize that this was going to be a horrible night indeed. He'd wondered why the progress of the light had been so deathly slow. Now he knew why, by reason of what he saw. And what he saw made him feel rather sick. The man with the lantern was quite plainly Professor Kell, bent nearly double with the weight of a grotesquely big thing on his back, a thing that flung a dim, contorted shadow on the ceiling. And that thing was a dead man. A corpse it was. The attitude proved that. With a numb relief, O'Hara realized it was not the body of Skip Handlin. This had been a much larger man than Skip, and the clothing was different from anything Hanlon had worn. The light was now disappearing down the stairway. For a moment, O'Hara felt undecided as to his next move. Should he follow Kell and his burden, or should he not take advantage of this fine opportunity to continue his search of the upper story? That scream still rang in his ears. There had been a very evident feminine quality in it, and the remembrance of that fact reproached him. 
Had he been guilty of mincing daintily about in this old house while a woman was being done to death under his nose, when a little bolder action on his part might have saved her? Stepping once more into the hall, he advanced to the door just closed behind the professor and tried it, only to find it locked. Out of a pocket came several articles best known to the profession, a piece of stiff wire, a skeleton key, and other paraphernalia calculated to reduce the obstinate mechanism to submission. For a minute, two, three, he worked at the ancient lock. Then, without a creak, the door swung open. A touch of oil to the hinges had ensured their silence. Jimmy O'Hara believed in being artistic in his work, especially when it came to fine points, and he was. He found himself in the same room where the drug cigars had been proved the undoing of Handlin and Perry. In order not to alarm the professor unduly by chance noises and perhaps invite a surprise attack upon himself, O'Hara closed the laboratory door behind him and let the lock spring again. Hastily, he made search of the place. No trace of the missing reporter could he find, except two half-consumed cigars in a corner whence the professor had impatiently kicked them. On the big table in the center of the room, however, was an object which excited his interest. It was apparently nothing more or less than a giant crook's tube connected in some way with a complicated mechanism contained in a wooden cabinet under the table. Probably this apparatus was concerned in the professor's weird experiments which had so aroused the countryside. He studied it curiously, his eyes for the moment closed in thought, until a slight sound somewhere near at hand caused him to open them wide. Was that Kel returning? Quickly he extinguished the lamp and glided to a nearby door, thinking to secrete himself here and take Kel by surprise. To his consternation, the door swung inward at a touch. He prepared instinctively for battle against any foe who might present himself. For a moment, he held himself taut. Then, nothing of an alarming nature having happened, he drew a swift breath of relief and flashed on his light. He gave vent to a low exclamation. The swiftly darting shaft from the torch had revealed the figure of a girl, bound and gagged. The girl lay trembling on a wretched bed in a corner of the dilapidated old chamber. O'Hara crossed the room and bent over her. Still wary of a trap, he glanced back in the direction of the laboratory door. All safe there. Jimmy made a haste to remove the cruel gag from her mouth. Courage, he whispered. Half a minute and you'll be free. He produced a knife with a suspiciously long blade and cut her bonds. He then assisted her to her feet, where she reeled dizzily. Realizing the need for fast action, he made her sit down while he massaged the bruised arms and ankles, which were badly swollen from the tight ropes. The girl had apparently been in the grip of such terrible fright that she had temporarily lost her power of speech. Mentally, he chalked up another score against the professor as the girl made several ineffectual attempts to speak. Easy, kid, Jimmy whispered. Just sit tight, and when you feel able, you can tell me all about it. I'm going to get him good for this, you can bank on that. She thanked him with a faint smile, and of a sudden she found her voice. Who are you? Where's father? Oh, tell me, please. I'm afraid that horrible man has murdered him. Are, are you a servant here? Oh, I don't know whom to trust. My name is Jimmy O'Hara replied the reporter briefly, and I hope you won't worry about me. I'm gunning for the prof myself. Tell me as quickly as you can what you know about him. He still kept an eye on the door of the adjoining laboratory. Any moment he expected to hear the sound of the old man's approach, the room would make an ideal place to ambush the maniac he had swiftly decided. I'm Norma Mannion. Please don't delay, but see if you can locate father. The girl's voice was agonized. I heard him groan a half hour ago, and a little later came a terrific crash. Oh. I'm afraid he's dead. Reluctantly, Jimmy gave up the idea of ambushing the professor. Wait here, he commanded curtly. If you hear a shot, join me as soon as you can. I want to take him alive if I can, but... With this parting hint, he disappeared through the door into the laboratory. Down the carpeted hall, he crept to the stairway. Here he stopped and listened, but to his sensitive ears came no sound from below. Must have gone down the cellar with the body, he muttered. Here goes for a general exploration. With more boldness than the occasion perhaps really justified, he descended the stairs and proceeded to examine the ground floor rooms minutely. The first was the room through which he had made entrance to the house. It proved to be but a storeroom containing nothing of interest, and he soon decided to waste no more time on it. The adjoining chamber, however, yielded some surprising finds. He had pushed back a dusty portiere to find himself in what could be nothing less than the professor's sleeping chamber. At present the bed was unoccupied, though it showed signs of recent use. The electric torch played swiftly over every possible corner which could constitute a hiding place for an assassin, revealing nothing. Now the ever-searching ray fell upon an old-fashioned dresser, on which was piled a miscellaneous array of articles. Here were combs, brushes, a wig, a huge magnifying glass, and a gold watch. With a barely suppressed exclamation, Jimmy pounced upon the gold timepiece. Handlins! So well did he know the particular design of his watch that he could have recognized it in the dark by sense of touch alone. 
So the old man was not averse to robbery among his other activities. The former two-story man thought fast. Handlin had probably been done in, and the body had been disposed of in some weird manner. The only thing that remained to be done, since the unlucky photographer was evidently past human help, was to cut short the professor's list of murders. With the intention of missing no essential detail, O'Hara swept the ray of the searchlight around the chamber once more, but discovered no more of importance. Deciding that the sleeping chamber could yield no further clue, he shut off the telltale ray and stepped noiselessly back into the next room. Here he groped his way around until he encountered a door which stood open. A moment's cautious exploration with an outstretched foot revealed the top step of a descending staircase. No faintest glimmer of light was visible, but muffled sounds proceeding from the depths told him that someone was below. With infinite care, feeling his way gingerly over the rickety old steps and fearful that an unexpected creak from one of the ancient boards would at any moment prove his undoing, he commenced the descent. Once a board did groan softly, causing him to stop in his tracks and stand with bated breath, he listened for sign of a movement below while his heart loudly told off a dozen strokes. Stealthily, he continued his progress until finally soft earth under his feet told him he had reached the cellar bottom. Now his straining eyes perceived a tiny bit of light, and simultaneously he became conscious of a deathly stench. The damp earth padding his footsteps, he advanced swiftly toward the source of light, which now seemed to lie in stripes across his line of vision. He soon saw that the stairs gave upon a small, boarded-off section of the cellar proper, and light was seeping between the boards. Ah, and here was a rickety door, fortuitously equipped with a large knothole. O'Hara applied an eye to this, and what he saw nearly ruined even his cast-iron nerve. The professor was working beside a heavy wooden cask from which issued the horrible stench. From time to time, a sodden thud told that he was hacking something to pieces with an axe. Now and then he would strain mightily at a dark and bulky thing which lay on the floor, a thing that required considerable strength to lift. It seemed to be getting lighter after each spasm of frenzied chopping. For a second, Kell's shadow wavered away from the thing, and the enervated newspaper man saw it plainly. His senses almost left him as he realized that he was witnessing the dismemberment of a human body. As he hacked the fragments of tissue from the torso, the fiend carefully deposited each in the huge cask. At such times a faint boiling sound was heard, and there arose an effluvium that bade fair to overcome even the monster engaged in the foul work. At last the limbs and head had been entirely removed. The professor evidently decided that the trunk should be left whole, and he put his entire strength into the job of getting it into the cask. It was almost more than he could negotiate, but finally a dull splash told that he had succeeded. At this moment, Jimmy O'Hara came out of his trance. The horrible proceeding had left him faint and shaken, and he wished heartily that he could leave the disgusting place as fast as his legs could carry him. But there was still work to be done, and he resolved to get it over. The lantern. First he must put that out of commission. The maniac would then be at his mercy. Slowly, steadily, he stole through the doorway, his eyes glued to the professor's back. Now he was within a yard of the lantern, and he drew back his foot for the kick. The next moment, Jimmy found himself gazing into the glaring eyes of his intended victim. Instinctively, he struck out with the clubbed automatic, but the blow must have fallen short or else the professor had developed an uncanny agility. Now, to his horror, he saw the flashing blade of the blood-stained axe raised on high. He had no time to dodge the blow. He pressed the trigger of the colt from the position in which he held it. The bullet grazed the upraised arm, the axe fell toward O'Hara from fingers lacking strength to retain it, and he grasped it by the handle in midair. The next moment the assassin collected his wits and sprang at him. Silently, the breath of both coming in gasps, the two men strove, each clawing desperately at the other's throat. The reporter fought with the knowledge that should he lose, he would never again see the light of day, the other with the fear of the justice that would deal with him. The maniac hugged his arms tightly about Jimmy, pinioning him so tightly that the reporter could not use his gun. At length, their convulsive movements brought them in close to the lantern, and the next instant, the cellar was plunged in darkness. A second later, the professor tripped over some hidden obstruction and fell, dragging his opponent with him to the earthen floor. To Jimmy's surprise, there was no further movement from the body beneath him. Could the old villain be playing possum? He cautiously shifted his hold and grasped the hidden throat. He pressed the professor's windpipe for a moment, but there was no answering struggle. Slowly, the truth dawned upon him. The heavy fall to the floor had rendered the older man insensible. He must work fast. Reaching into his pocket, he brought out the ever-handy electric torch and flashed it over the features of his prisoner. Kell was breathing heavily. With dexterous hands, O'Hara swiftly went through the old man's pockets, removing all which might tend to make that worthy dangerous. An ugly-looking pistol of large caliber, a blackjack similar to his own, and a small bottle. The latter item Jimmy examined curiously, finally uncorking it and inhaling the contents. 
He inhaled, not wisely, but too well. The fumes from the vial were nigh overpowering, and he reeled back, nauseated. The cork he hastily replaced. Just what the nature of the powerful stuff was, he never attempted to discover. One acquaintance was enough. He staggered to his feet and got the lantern lighted, then sat, gun in hand, waiting for his prisoner's return to his senses. This was becoming increasingly imminent, judging by certain changes in the professor's respiration. Finally, there came a series of shuddering movements as the man attempted to raise his battered body. "'Get up, you damn butcher!' ordered Jimmy, and march upstairs. And just remember that I've got you covered. Don't make any false moves. He prodded the prostate form of the by now glaring fiend before him. The stench of the place was nearly overcoming him, and again he felt an overwhelming desire to dash madly from that den of evil and once more breathe God's fresh air. Under the stimulus of several shoves, the professor finally won to his feet and stumbled up the stairs. Jimmy was taking no chances and kept the automatic sharply digging into the ribs of his prisoner. The fight, however, seemed temporarily to have been all taken out of the old man, and he made no resistance as the reporter drove him on up to the laboratory. The room he found exactly as he left it. At a word from him, Norma Mannion came from her hiding place in the horrible room where she had been kept prisoner. With a hysterical scream, she fell limply to the floor. The sight of her father's murderer had proved too much for her. Forgetting his prisoner for the moment, Jimmy sprang to the girl's side. Kel chose this moment to make a dash for freedom. His footsteps, however, were not as noiseless as he had intended, and O'Hara whirled just in time to see his quarry about to throw open the hall door. Jimmy dove for his gun, only to encounter the professor's mysterious vial, which, though forgotten, still lay in his pocket. With no time to think, he acted purely upon instinct. His arm drew back, and the bottle flew straight for the professor's head. By a miracle, the missile missed its mark. Came a shivering crash as the bottle struck a stud in the massive door. Of a sudden recalling the terrific potency of the contents of that particular bottle, Jimmy gasped in dismay. Norma Mannion's safety drove every other thought from his mind. At any cost, he must remove her from the proximity of those lethal fumes. Hastily and without a backward glance, he gathered the girl into his arms and dashed into the room where he had first found her. Ascertaining that she had but swooned, he placed her gently on the bed. In some perplexity as to his next move, he stared at the beautiful face now so wan and white. Queer that he hadn't noticed the fact before. She was beautiful. He even took a second look, then noting a continued absence of all sound from the laboratory, decided to investigate. Gingerly he pushed open the door, sniffing the air cautiously as he advanced. To his nostrils gradually came a slight scent, which, though almost imperceptible, made his senses real. As he approached the hall door, he found the atmosphere heavy with the soporific vapors from the broken vial, and he staggered drunkenly. He gave a start of surprise. On the floor, lying in a grotesque huddle which suggested a most unpleasant possibility, was the inert body of Professor Kell. Jimmy bent over the body and put an experienced ear to the heart. Yes, there was a faint beat, very faint. Even as he listened, he perceived a slight increase in the respiration. Now the breath began coming in great choking gasps, only to die suddenly into next to nothing. At last, with a rueful sigh, Jimmy reached to his hip and produced the private O'Hara flagon. He stooped over the professor's form once more, and by dint of much prying at clenched jaws, managed to force a sizable charge of fiery liquid down the old man's throat. Jimmy had just begun to entertain a strong hope that this latter effort would bring the professor to life, when his keen ear detected signs of a commotion below. He sprang from his position over the slowly reviving Kell and leaped to a vantage point beside the door. A blackjack miraculously appeared from some hidden part of his anatomy, and the ever-dependable cult also became in evidence. Now came the banging of a door, muffled voices, a crash as of a chair overturned in the dark. Up rolled a horrible oath, and the same was rendered in a voice to Jimmy sweetly familiar. Came the sound of footsteps on the stairway and several persons coming along the hall. "'Where in hell is Jimmy?' roared a wicked voice. If he's met with any monkey business in this hell hall, I'll see that damn place burns to the ground before I leave it. Delightedly, Jimmy jerked open the door. Still alive, chief, he chirped as the old man strode into the laboratory. Bland was followed by Perry, who seemed to be in a sort of daze. Bringing up the rear were a pair of plain clothesmen whom Jimmy knew very well. Almost too well. One of these gentlemen bore a lantern which reminded Jimmy strongly of some he had seen that night guarding an open ditch in the public highway. The professor had fully regained consciousness and was struggling to his feet. As for Norma Mannion, she had suddenly appeared, leaning weakly against the door casing and was surveying the group in great alarm. After being assured by O'Hara that they were her friends, she smiled wanly. To Bland and the others, she was, of course, an unexpected factor in the weird night's doings, and for several moments they regarded her curiously. 
At length, Jimmy, sensing the question in the old man's eyes, elected to offer a few words of explanation. Miss Manion has just been through a terrible experience, he said. She and her father have been for some time at the mercy of this monster, indicating Kel, and her nerves are completely shattered. We'd better get her out of this as quickly as we can. Mike! Hard-boiled Bland glared at one of the officers. Don't stand her with your teeth and your gums like that. Take this girl out to my car and let her lie down. She needs a stimulant, too. If you search my car and find any red liquor in the left back door pocket, I don't know a thing about it. And stay with her so she won't be afraid to go to sleep. She smiled in silent gratitude and allowed the plainclothesman to lead her away from that chamber of horror. The reporter lost no time in telling Bland of his failure to find Skip Handlin. He went on to acquaint his chief with the facts of all that had occurred while he had been at the professor's house. The fiery old fellow listened grimly. When Jimmy came to the story of the corpse and the cask, the editor breathed one word. Mannion. Jimmy nodded sadly. All eyes turned to the dejected huddle on the floor that was Professor Kell. Finally, Bland could wait no longer but fixed a terrible eye on the murderer and demanded harshly, Where's Handlin? Now the professor burst into a fit of insane laughter, laughter that curdled the blood of the listeners. You ask me that? <laughs> it's almost too good! <laughs> you sent your two previous reporters out to my house to pry into my secrets and thought to display my name all over your yellow sheet. <laughs> but you forgot that you were dealing with Professor Anton Kell, didn't you? The last he fairly shrieked. A lot of people have tried to intrude up on me before, but none have ever escaped me. We know that, cut in Jimmy, for he was getting impatient and the old man's boasting seemed out of place. You're slated for the rope anyway after what I discovered down cellar. He jerked his eyes in the direction of the door significantly. Now we propose to find Handlin and the better it will be for you if you tell us what you have done with him. Otherwise, you can go to hell, screamed the maniac. If you are so clever, find out for yourselves. He isn't so far away that you couldn't touch him by reaching out your hand. In fact, he's been with you quite a while. <laughs> well, if you must know, there he is. With an insane chuckle, he pointed at Horace Perry, and Perry did a strange thing. Yes, you fiend, here I am. Whose voice was that? Was it Perry speaking, or was it Skip Handlin? Most assuredly, Perry stood before them, but the voice, in a subtle manner, reminded the group strongly of poor old Skip. As he spoke, Perry had launched himself at the professor's throat and had to be restrained by the others. Savagely, he fought them, but slowly and surely, they overcame his struggles and placed him writhing in a chair. Of a sudden, Bland leaned forward and scrutinized Perry's face sharply. Had the reporter gone insane, too? The pupils of the eyes had taken on a sort of queer contraction, a fixed quality that was almost ludicrous. He looked like a man under hypnosis. He'd gone limp in their grasp, but now suddenly he stiffened. The eyes underwent another startling change, this time glowing undoubtedly with a look of reason. Bland was mystified and waited for Perry to explain his queer conduct. The latter seemed finally to come too. Simultaneously, he realized that his peculiar lapse from consciousness had been observed by the others. Yes, I may as well admit it. He said with a wry smile. Ever since I came back from my assignment with Kel, I've had a hell of a time. Half the time I've been in a daze and have not had the least idea what I was doing. Funny part of it is that I have seemed to keep right on doing things even while I was out of my head. He told briefly of the visions he had had in which he had seemed to contend with his brother reporter, the horrid sensations as he felt himself overcome, the black oblivion in which he then found himself, and the mysterious manner in which he had left Keegan on that ill-fated assignment. What have you done to Handlin? Jimmy's voice cut in. He was standing over the form of the maniac, rigid and menacing. You have exactly two minutes to go. Find out for yourself, snarled the bruised and battered fiend. I will, was the answer, and on the instant, a horrible shriek rent the air. Jimmy had quickly grasped both of the professor's arms at the wrists and was slowly twisting them in a grip of iron. Kell's face went white, the lips writhed back over toothless gums, the eyes closed in the supreme effort to withstand the excruciating pain. Then, enough, enough, he screamed. O'Hara eased the pressure slightly, but retained his hold upon the claw-like hands. Talk fast, he ordered. The old man struggled futilely in the grasp of the powerful reporter, finally glancing in the direction of the others. Would they show signs of pity? Surely not hard-boiled bland. The chief was watching the struggles of the victim through a cloud of tobacco smoke, which he was slowly exhaling through his nose. The plainclothesman displayed no sign of interest at all. The game was up. Very well, 
he said sullenly. Adlin and Perry are both occupying the same body. What? roared Bland. Jimmy, I guess you'll have to put the screws to him some more. He's trying to make fools of us at the last minute. No, no, screamed the professor. What I say is true. I've been working for years on my system of deastralization. This last year, I at length perfected my electric deastralizer, which amplifies and exerts the fifth influence of decohesion. The whole party began to look uneasy and gazed apprehensively at the huge crook's tube which still stood in its supporting frame on the table. I've been forced to experiment on animals for the most part, the professor continued. I succeeded in deastralizing a dog and a bull and caused them to exchange bodies. The bodies continued to function. I was enthusiastic. Other experiments took place of which I will not tell you. Finally, I began to long for a human subject on which to try my fifth influence. Just get down to cases if you don't mind, Cal. The chief wanted action. Suppose you tell us just what you did to Handlin and where we can find him. I might as well mention that your life depends upon it. If we find that you have done for him, something worse than death may happen to you. The tone was menacing. Although Handlin was a comparatively late acquisition to the old chief's staff, still he had been loyal to the paper. When your two damned reporters entered my driveway, Kel resumed, I saw them coming through a powerful glass which I always have on hand. I had no desire to see them, but they forced themselves upon me. At last I determined that they should furnish material for my experiments. If your men had looked into the grove behind the barn, they would have found the automobile which furnished two more subjects I was keeping on hand in a room upstairs. Old Mannion and his daughter gave me quite a bit of trouble, but I kept them drugged most of the time. He broke out of the room tonight, though, and I had to kill him. <laughs> it was self-defense, he said slyly. Anyway, I found it was possible to make two astrals exchange bodies. But I also wanted to see if it were possible to cause two astrals to occupy the same body at the same time, and if so, what the result would be. <laughs> I found out. It was rare sport to watch your star reporter leave my house. He was damned glad to leave, I believe. <laughs> Again came the insane cackle. Guess we have to believe him whether we want to or not. The detective came to life. How about making him release Handlin's, what'd you call it, astral from Perry's body? Just a moment. The voice now was unmistakably Handlin's, though it was issuing from the throat of Perry. In the minute I have in consciousness, let me suggest that before you do any more deastralizing, you locate my body. Until then, if I'm released from this one, I'm a dead man. The words struck the group dumb. Where was Handlin's body? Could the professor produce it? That worthy looked rather haunted at that moment, and they began to see the fear of death coming upon him. Mercy, mercy, he begged, as the four men started to advance upon him. As soon as I had deastralized Handlin, I destroyed his body in my pickling barrel down cellar. But there is another way. He paused, uncertain as to how his next words would be received. Go out and get the Mannion girl. She can be deastralized, and friend Handlin can have her body. At this suggestion, advanced so naively, the four men recoiled in horror. It was entirely too much even for hard-boiled Bland, and he could hardly restrain himself from applying the editorial fist to the leering face before him. Undoubtedly, Professor Kell was hopelessly insane, and for that reason he held himself in leash. Kell, you're slated to pull off one more stunt, Jimmy addressed the cringing heap. You know what it is. Get busy. And just remember that I'm standing over here, he indicated a corner well separated from the rest, with this cannon aimed in your direction. If things aren't just according to Hoyle, you get plugged. Get me? What about it, men? Bland spoke up. Is it gonna be treating Hanlon right to deastralize him now? Or be his last chance to have a body on this earth? Unfortunately, that body never belonged to Hanlon, said O'Hara. Hence I fail to see why Perry should be discommoded for the balance of his life with a companion astral. Perry's clearly entitled to his own body, free and unhampered. Friend Skip is out of luck unless... Well, I don't mind telling you, Kel, that you just gave me an idea. Snap into it now! The professor dragged himself to his feet and under the menace of the automatic fumbled under the table until he had located the intricate apparatus before mentioned. Now, if Mr. Perry or 
Adlin, will kindly recline at full length on this table, he said with an obscene leer. The experiment will begin. Just remember, Cal, this is no experiment, advised Bland, fixing the professor with an ugly eye. You do as you're told. The other made no reply, but threw a hidden switch. Perry, lying flat on his back on the ancient table, suddenly found himself being bathed by what seemed to be a ray of light, and yet was not a ray of light. What was it? It was surely not visible, yet it was tangible. A terrific force was emanating from that devilish globe above him, drawing him out of himself, or... No, was he expanding? Again, his ears became filled with confused, horrible sounds. The outlines of the room faded from sight. He felt a strange sense of inflation, of lightness, oblivion. From where the others sat, a gasp of wonder went up. At the first contact of the switch, there had been a momentary flash of greenish light within the bulb, and then a swift transition to a beautiful orange. It had then faded altogether, leaving the glass apparently inert and inactive. But it was not so. The form lying beneath the bulb was evidently being racked with untold tortures. The face became a thing of horror. Now it had twisted into a grotesque semblance of Handlin's. Now it again resembled Perry's. The professor quietly increased the pressure of the current. From the bulb emanated a steel-gray exhalation of what must be termed light, and yet so real it was seemingly material. Assuredly it was not a ray of light as we understand light. It came in great beating throbs in which the actual vibrations were entirely visible. Under each impact, the body of Perry seemed to change, slowly at first, then with increasing speed. The body was now swelled to enormous size. Bland reached forward to touch it. This decohering influence, the professor was murmuring almost rapidly, causes the atoms that go to make a living body repel one another. When the body is sufficiently nebulized, the soul- Back! Back, you fool! He suddenly shrieked, grasping Bland by the arm. Do you want to kill him? Bland hurriedly retreated, convinced perforce that Kel's alarm was genuine. The editorial fingers had penetrated the subject's garments without resistance and sank into the body as easily as if it were so much soft soap. The body continued to expand until, at length, even the hard-headed plainclothesman realized that it had been reduced to a mere vapor. Within this horrid vaporized body which nearly filled the room and which had now lost all semblance to a man could be discerned two faint shapes. Swiftly the professor extinguished the lantern. The shapes, vague though they were, could be recognized as those of Horace Perry and Skip Handlin, and they were at strife. All eyes were now focused on Professor Kell, who was evidently waiting for something to happen. The two apparitions within the body cloud were at death grips. One had been overcome and one was temporarily helpless. It was that of Handlin. And then again, the astral of Perry forcibly ousted that of Handlin from the cloud cyst. And at that instant, Professor Kell shut off the influence tube. At once a terrific metamorphosis took place. There came a sharp sound, almost like a clap of thunder, with the slight exception that this was occasioned by exactly the reverse effect. Instead of being an explosion, it might more properly be termed an implosion, for the mist cloud suddenly vanished. The decohering influence having been removed, the cloud had condensed into the form of Perry. Apparently none the worse, he was even now beginning to recover consciousness. The astral of Handlin was no longer visible, though hovering in the vicinity. Perry's body was again his own. At this time, Jimmy O'Hara elected to start something new by hitting the professor a workmanlike blow on the back of the head with the butt of his automatic. The next thing Bland or anyone else present knew, the unconscious body of the professor was on the table and Jimmy was groping for the concealed switch. At length he found it, and the green flash of light appeared in the bulb, followed by the brilliant orange manifestation. What in hell are you doing? gasped Bland. Deastralizing the professor, replied O'Hara cheerfully. Don't you get the idea yet? Watch. Fascinated, the four men saw the terrific emanation take its baleful effect. As before, the body commenced to expand and gradually took on a misty outline. Larger and larger it grew, until finally it had become a vast cloud of intangible nothingness which filled the room like some evil nebula. A cry of consternation from the detective aroused Jimmy. Skip Handlin's astral had appeared within the field of the nebula to fight for possession. There ensued what was perhaps the weirdest encounter ever witnessed. Though he was in poor physical shape, the professor seemed to have an extremely powerful astral, and for some time the spectators despaired of Handlin's victory. Once the latter, evidently realizing that the powerful influence tube had rendered him visible, glanced sharply in Jimmy's direction. O'Hara was considerably puzzled at this, but watched the progress of the struggle tensely. At length, the moment seemed to arrive which the reporter's astral had been awaiting. It turned tail and fled away from the astral of the professor, disappearing beyond the outer confines of the nebula. Jimmy suddenly divined the other's purpose and dived for the hidden switch. 
As he had anticipated, Handlin had finally given up the attempt to overcome the Astral of Kel by force and had made up his mind to accomplish his end by strategy. Almost on the instant that Jimmy's hand closed on the switch, the reporter's astral again leaped into the field of the nebula. Fiercely, it signaled to the former second-story man to shut off the current, but the admonition was unnecessary for Jimmy had already done so. Swiftly, the cloud cyst faded. Even as the group caught a fleeting sight of Skip Hanlon, the last that mortal eyes would ever see him as he actually was, there came a violent disturbance at the edge of the shrinking nebula. Would the speed of condensation of the atoms which comprised the body of Professor Kell serve to shut out the pursuing astral of Kell? Even Bland held his breath. The cloud lost its luminous quality, the action of condensation increasing in speed. It was barely visible in the enshrouding gloom. An astral had long since been enveloped within the rapidly accumulating substance. Came a sudden clap of sound as before, and the final act of resolution had been accomplished. Whether the professor had succeeded in regaining a position within the cloud cyst before the crucial second, none could say. Jimmy relighted the lantern. Apparently the effect of the love tap administered by his automatic was more or less of a lasting character, and the men were put to some ado to restore the body of Kel to consciousness. At length their efforts began to bear fruit, however, and it became expedient to remove the patient to the softer couch in the sitting room below. As they moved forward to lay hold of the limp body, a figure appeared in the doorway to the hall. It was the plainclothesman, Riley. How about getting underway for town? He wanted to know. Is the old party croaked yet? Miss Mannion has had a fierce time and says she won't stay near this house another minute. I don't like this place myself either. Do you know I just got kicked by a pole parrot? Let's get away from here. Hold on, Riley. What are you talking about? Growled Bland. Kicked by a pole parrot? Yut. That's all right, Chief. Broke in the now thoroughly cheerful Perry. That jackass I shot could probably have told us all about it. I positively know the beast could talk. Humph! <laughs> snorted Bland. Well, if a donkey can talk and a bull can bite and a hound can hook, why shouldn't a parrot- Judas Priest, I'm getting as crazy as the rest of you. Hurry up and get Kel downstairs so we can see who he is. There I go again. Oh, go lie down, Riley. But look, Bland, look. Riley was pointing a demoralized finger at a cage in the corner. He tugged frantically at Bland's coat sleeve. See what's in there, won't you? I- well, I did find some liquor in your car and Miss Mannion made me take some. I- I didn't know it would do this to me. Look in there. Please, Mr. Bland. Bland gave Riley a dark look, but nevertheless he reached for O'Hara's flashlight. In the cage, two yellow eyes blinked sleepily out at him. Perry began to laugh. Why, there's nothing in there but a cat. Skip and I heard it purring when we first came in here this afternoon. Guess Riley. Great God, Jimmy, give me a gun. Hard-boiled Bland for the moment failed to merit his sobriquet. The torch in his hand threw a trembling beam full into the cage. It's a snake, and there, it's doing it again. A snake it was, indubitably, a huge black specimen with bright yellow stripes. Bland's frenzied yell seemed not to have excited it at all, for now the sleek fellow had arched its body neatly and was calmly licking its sides with a long forked tongue. After a moment it halted the operation long enough to rub its jaw against a bar of its cage and gave vent to a sociable mew. Even this could not dash the spirits of Horace Perry. He laughed delightedly again as he laid Bland by the arm. A creature is perfectly harmless, Chief, he told the editor. Somewhere I suppose there's a mighty dangerous kitty cat at large, but there's no sense in taking it out on this poor reptile. Let's live and let live. With a show of reluctance, Bland returned Jimmy's automatic, then strode over to where lay the form of Kel. Perry and O'Hara lingered by the cage long enough to arrange a plan to let the snake outdoors as soon as opportunity offered, after which they joined their chief. Riley went out to resume his vigil in Bland's car, while his fellow sleuth prepared to light the way downstairs. Under his guidance, the sick man was carried below without mishap. Downstairs, the now conscious form of the venerable professor was laid out on the ancient sofa until his scenes could clear a bit. Presently, the eyelids fluttered open and a feeble voice asked, Where the deuce am I? And how did all you guys get here? A joyous gasp went up. That voice! Although uttered in somewhat the same vocal quality as Kells, the intonation and accents had strangely altered. O'Hara leaned eagerly over the figure on the couch. The question he asked was startling in its incongruity. How are you feeling, Skip? Rotten was the reply from the lips of Kel. What hit me such a crack on the dome? I feel as if I'd been dragged through a knot hole. Let me up. Stay still, commanded O'Hara, kindly but firmly. You aren't fit to move yet. You're going on a long ride and will need your strength. Don't talk either. A half hour later, they left the house. In the front yard, the editor called a hasty conclave, which included the entire party. Hard-boiled Bland has never been known to talk so much at a stretch before or since. Before we start back... He began, we'd better come to an understanding. In the first place, Skip, come over here a minute. Norma Mannion uttered an involuntary cry of fear as the aged form of Kel passed by her. 
Skip's instant response to his name had, of course, been perfectly natural to him, but it had an odd effect on the others. Miss Mannion and gentlemen, Bland went on with a bow of mock ceremony, I want you to meet Mr... Uh, Mr... Ah, hell, call him Saunders. This is Mr. Kenneth Saunders, ladies and gentlemen. When he gets a shave and has his new face patched up, I believe you will like his appearance much more than you do now. Seriously, though, folks, I hope that with a little fixing up, the gentleman will hardly resemble Professor Anton Kell. Kell is dead. Obviously, however, this gentleman can hardly continue his existence as Skip Handlin. Hence, well, hence Mr. Saunders. And don't forget the name. Now, another little matter. This house has proven a curse to humanity. What has transpired here need never be known. Would it not be the wiser to eliminate all traces of tonight's happenings? There is a way. He looked significantly at the others. You mean, began Perry, that we destroy all traces of Professor Kell's villainy. Although he's no more, still someone might notice that his body actively remains, and no one wants to do any explaining. It's the only way we can protect Hanlon, one of the sleuths ruminated half to himself. No judge would ever believe a word about this deastralization business. The chances are we would all go to the booby hatch and Hanlon would go to prison for Kell's crimes. There were four of us that witnessed the fact of the... the... soul transfusion, though, Perry objected. Wouldn't that be enough to clear Skip? Besides, wouldn't it be possible for us to lead a jury out here and duplicate the experiment? Too much undesirable publicity, growled Bland, who for once in his life had found reason to keep something good out of the headlines. What do you say, people? I move, we move. From the detective who had had the uncomfortable job of attending to Norma Mannion. Gentlemen, I believe we understand each other, said Jimmy quietly. Now I'm going into the barn, significantly, to see if everything's all right. While I'm there, something might happen. You understand? The others nodded silent assent. In the snug seat of Jimmy's speedster, Norma Mannion shivered as she followed the direction indicated by her companion's finger. To the westward could be perceived a dull red glow, which even as they watched with fascinated eyes, developed into an intense glare. Gradually, the fading stars became eclipsed in the greater glory. Three cars, motors throbbing as if eager to be gone, stood a space apart on the main road. The car behind O'Hara's was the Mannion machine, now occupied by Bland and Riley. The remaining one was a touring car and contained the balance of the party. Perry was at the wheel, and beside him sat the handlin kell saunders combination. Thus passes a den of horror, whispered Jimmy to his companion. It's the funeral pyre of my father, the girl answered simply. She'd long since recovered from her initial outburst of grief at her loss and now watched the progress of the conflagration dry-eyed. At length, Jimmy slipped an arm protectingly about the trembling shoulders. You've seen enough, he said, as the three cars raced from the scene of the Holocaust, faint streamers in the east told of the rising orb of day. Goodbye, Keegan, forever, murmured Norma. Amen, O'Hara devoutedly agreed. End of Section 8